All right, friends, we've got health assessment, comprehensive overview number three. This is going to cover week six and seven. There's a lot of topics. We're talking about cardiac. We're talking more about some cranial nerves. We're talking about musculoskeletal. We're talking about nutrition. We're going here. We're going there. We're going a little bit over everywhere, and it's going to be okay because we're all going to get through it, and it's going to be fine. So take a deep breath. We're going to walk down memory lane. And then once you guys get this, I'm going to start doing the individual chapters so I can itemize each section. So if I have someone from a capstone or exit HESI class or wherever um, and they need to refer back, they can. Okay. Um, so, yeah, let's go ahead and get to the next slide and let's do this thing. It's going to be great. I'm excited. All right, let's talk about the spine and spinal positioning and spinal deformity or malformation. So how can I start this off? So basically your spine or your backbone is your body's central support structure. It's made up of a chain of bones, which is called the vertebrae, uh, that includes ligaments and discs. Uh, when viewed from the front or behind, healthy spines will appear as perfectly straight down the middle of your back, right? When viewed from a side, um, there is a slight S-shaped curve. Uh, the curve allows for even distribution of weight and flexibility of the movement, right? So sometimes the natural curvature is not aligned properly or it's exaggerated. And this results in the conditions of scoliosis, kyphosis, and lordosis. So first off, kyphosis is a rounding of the spine in the upper back. Kid just dropped something everyone's cool there's a cry it's because she got scared not because she got hurt you okay boo okay it's gonna be a big loud cry there it goes she's okay guys i swear she just got scared you okay mama come here come here come here Oh man, I know it's nap time, isn't it? Oh, oh girl, come here. Oh, mama girl. Oh, mama bear, you okay? About let's settle. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, sorry about that. Lordosis is going to be uh, an increased curve towards the front of your body in the lower back or in the neck area. Um, again, kyphosis is a rounding of the spine in the upper back that can look like, uh, like a hump. And then scoliosis is when the spine curves from side to side in an S-shape formation. Um, or it can also go into a C-shape rather than just being straight. So uh, scoliosis, please note that it causes a sideways curvature of your spine. It usually is diagnosed in early childhood just before puberty. Um, a curve that measures more than 10 degrees uh, on an x-ray is considered scoliosis, FYI. Uh, the curve, like I said, is either S or C shaped. What else can I tell you about it? Um, the spine basically rotates or twists in addition to curving from side to side. Um, scoliosis, what can I tell you? Oh, there's different types. There's like idiopathic where it's like, that's the most common. Um, it affects like adolescents, uh, more common in girls than in boys. Uh, there's like congenital scoliosis, right? Which is the spinal malformation that they're born with. There's like neuromuscular scoliosis. Um, it develops in children that have things like Marfan syndrome, uh, muscular dystrophy, cerebral palsy, spina bifida, uh, things like that. My stepsister, um, her name is Joey, and she had spina bifida. Uh, so uh, there's also adult de novo scoliosis, and it's due to uh, degeneration of the spine that comes with aging. That's why we constantly talk about osteoporosis and how that can re relate to other spinal malformations because of 
the amount of weight and pressure with the amount of porous holes as a result of, you know, a corticosteroid use for years, depending on what the disease process is, be it an immunologic process, uh, to be, be it uh, COPD, um, uh, be it uh, asthma, wh whatever you would use uh, recurrent corticosteroids over. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, uh, people with cancer or lymphadenopathy or reoccurring infections. I mean, the list goes on and on and on, right? Um, so th this is why uh, this could be a major issue. Um, and then relatable to kyphosis, uh, again, there's like postural kyphosis, there's congenital kyphosis, what's the one, what's the one, uh, uh, Schwer mm, mm, come on, come on, come on, come on, Sh uh, ooh, Schirman's kyphosis, Schwerman's kyphosis, Schir mm, S-C-H-E-U-R-E, A-R-M-A-N-N-S, Schwerman's, okay. Schwarman's ky kyphosis. I believe that's right. Anyways, um, I don't want you to know the specific types of kyphosis at this level. What I need for you to know is just kyphosis, lordosis, scoliosis, and that goes around the clock as well. So the big three is going to say that. I'm just trying to, again, enhance your learning and understanding of what actually is going on around you. And I'm also snapping at my child who needs to give me the bottle of milk because she is dripping milk everywhere and making an art project. Gimme, gimme, gimme. So um, don't worry about postural versus congenital versus the one I attempted to, to sound out, but I'm able to spell, so that's got to mean something, right? And then lordosis, uh, there's cervical and lumbar lordosis. Uh, it's also called like sway back. This is the worst slide ever. And I almost want to keep it in, so you're like, aw. Poor kiddo, but at the same time, that's so loud, I could only imagine how annoying that would be. I, I'm going to debate on this. Um, so cervical and lumbar lordosis, it's called a sway back. Um, Athena, Nicola, Isadora, Ophelia. Annoying, child. Annoying. Love you, annoying. Can you please? Can you please? I didn't mean literally. Stop. All right. So I think that's all I have for this slide and I'm going to go put a little kiddo to a nap and then I will return without someone banging and clanging. So next slide. All right, so muscles, bone, joints, inspection, and palpation. We need to be concerned with legs that are two different sizes. There can be many reasons for legs being two different sizes to name a few. Um, we can have a stroke and they have muscle atrophy on one leg versus the other because uh, the stroke was in um, that side, right? Simply put. Uh, or we could have a DVT. Or uh, we could have cellulitis, things of that nature, right? That'll definitely change the size of one leg to the other. So we would need to measure the circumference by way of a tape measure. Uh, to determine the difference in muscle size, if any, all right? We need to palpate both legs to determine muscle tenderness. I know that this sounds like pretty easy facts. Oh boy, in order to determine if there is tenderness and or what you would consider pain, you would have to physically touch it. Yes, we would. I know, revolutionary, but here we are, right? So again, remember, bottom line nurse, you guys are way smarter than this. So just roll with me. You guys got this. I'm not even worried. So assessment tools and scales. We have a goniometer. And let me just go ahead and say that I have put my foot in my mouth now twice in the history of me being an educator. And I'm just about sick and tired of saying something and putting my foot in my mouth and sounding confident about it because goniometer is one of those things I was making fun of. And I said, you're never going to see this again. And uh, four and a half, five weeks later, here we are. So that's foot and mouth number one. Now, luckily I have two feet and last semester, I was going off and off and off about how nobody cares about BUN. Everybody cares about creatinine. BUN, no one cares. It's not a good measure. BUN, BUN only shows dehydration. Creatinine is a better measure because of the toxicity. Da, 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 right? Like I went off, off, off on mad amounts of slides about how nobody cares about BUN. I'm so high, I'm so tired of people picking BUN over creatinine. And I swear on everything that was good and holy, BUN came back. 
when I was actually teaching my own lecture series to my exit HESI students who were preparing for their exit HESI. And I just walked right over it and felt like I was about Thumbelina size. I felt that big. So I am done talking trash about anything because the second I do, it comes back to haunt me. And the goniometer was my haunting thing. So it's used to measure the degree of joint flexion and extension. Please remember that. Please remember the Lovelet scale or the Lovett scale, sorry, is used to grade and record muscle strength. All right. Know that palpating both legs is used to determine muscle tenderness and know that measuring both legs determines the muscle size. I know that sounds crazy, but let's just understand these concepts and then let's go to the next slide. Okay, friends, the technique to test the strength of the trapezius muscle that is innervated by the cranial nerve 11, or the spinal accessory nerve, is to have the client shrug their shoulders while the nurse tries to push them down. All right, those are huge, ridiculous, overbearing amounts of words that don't need to be happened. So let me help you here and make this very simple. In order to test cranial nerve 11, remember 11 is the number one next to the number one. Why is she being ridiculous? We'll get there in just a second. Hang tight with that. Just keep that thought in your head. All right, so cranial nerve 11, which we can say spinal accessory, whatever, I don't care. Um, or we can say glossopharyngeal. Again, whatever. Trapezius muscle. Trapezius muscle is usually the muscle that is uh, the one that uh, causes you pain when you're stressed out. We call it the angel wings muscle, right? Because that would theoretically be where your angel wings come from. And there used to be an old wives tale in the South at least that if you had those types of burning shoulder pains, it was because you were missing your wings and your wings were missing you. That's cute and fine and dandy. But the fact of the matter is, is you have muscle and postural issues that could be easily fixed uh, within 30 days, if it's not too bad, and um, we sit there and feel the burn on purpose just because it's cute? No, that's that's dumb. Let's do something about that. So how do we test? Well, what I do is I get my uh, tips of my fingers, and I put them over the tops of my patient's shoulder, and I say, hey, I'm going to push down. Don't let me push down. And then I push down and then they build up and shrug up against resistance. Or you could simply say, hey, um, this is uh, Professor Rickert at his best. He goes, hey, how do you test cranial nerve 11? I don't know. And then shrugs his shoulders. <gasps> Revolutionary. Okay. And then I took it one step further. You ready? Remember how I told you that one and one is 11? Okay, cool. Remember how I told you cranial nerve 11 is spinal accessory nerve? Okay, cool. When you shrug your shoulders, I want you to look in the mirror. What are your hands doing? They're, they're going straight down. And what number does it make? <gasps> it makes 11. Okay, next slide. So gait and imbalance assessment, uh, basically we want to make sure that someone is walking appropriately. We want to make sure that the stride length is pretty symmetrical for each, you know, each step, step where we're being consistent um, and that we don't have much deviation in the, the length of the stride itself. Um, arms aren't going to swing together. That would be bizarre. Ours, arms usually swing in the opposite of one another. And then... Um, things like uh, unsteady gait, exaggerated limps, foreign leaning posture, shuffling of the feet, uh, those would be considered abnormal assessment findings. So uh, we need to know why this is important. What's the most common nursing diagnosis related to a patient with an abnormal gait? Uh, risk for false. How about that? So we need to make sure that when we see people like this, that we are taking measures to um, help reduce the risk of falls uh, in this type of patient. So basically, what they want you to know is to be able to see what normal findings for uh, an, a, a gait assessment looks like versus abnormal. So if you can clearly do that and you understand that risk for falls is our biggest concern, uh, you can just move to the next slide. All right, so for this slide, we need to understand what it is that we have to bend in order 
to articulate an action of external rotation and abduction, of flexion of the elbow, of hyperextension. So I need for you to be able to explain to me what hyperextension looks like. So, for example, if the shoulder is uh, moving the arm straight backward, we're going to be checking for hyperextension. So I need for you to be able to match those up in your head so that when we have to do these types of tests, we can go ahead and tell them which way they need to move and go ahead and move ourselves in that position so they can just mimic that. Um, so, and, and be able to see it in your head. Move your body as, you know, you're reading to find out what it is that, it, that you're doing and how you're doing it. And understand as you're doing that in kind of slow motion, how that makes sense in your head, right? So it's extension, which means I'm not going to be bending. I'm going to be flexing out. All right, cool. So I can feel my shoulder blade and is it internally rotated or externally rotated? Yeah, externally rotated. Okay, got it. Got it. So that's how I want you guys to do this. It's much easier um, to understand these if you do the action together. All right. Um, that's all I'm going to say about this because you just need to know every single one of them. Next slide. Vitamin deficiencies are a big, 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 big problem in the hospital. We have multiple vitamin deficiencies seen in people with anemias, um, multiple with, you know, hypothyroidism, multiple with uh, autoimmune disorders, multiple with people who are malnourished. The list goes on and on and on. Um, and then you have the complications of having disease processes which throw off other uh, vitamin deficiencies that you might not have already had, right? So here's how this works. You need to know which ones go with what, period. Period, point, paragraph. There's going to be a lot on vitamin deficiencies. Why? Well, because honestly, a lot of times doctors and nurses miss really, really silly things because we're thinking so big that we forget that as imaginative and as big as we are, we all fall in the grand scheme of the universe. We all fall very small and it's the small pieces that matter. Okay. These are the small pieces that matter. So I'll have a patient that comes in and um, they're very weak and their belly is going stupid and they have massive amounts of diarrhea. They're shaky. They're quaky. They feel awful. Right. Um, and people think, Oh, this is, you know, an autoimmune disorder possibly. Maybe they have cancer, you know, maybe this is going on, maybe that's going on. But as I'm looking at them, I notice that even though they're beautiful and they look incredibly healthy and their hair is shiny and, they look to be in their 30s, right? What the doctor doesn't notice that I notice because I am what I am and I've experienced what I've experienced, I know that that girl's hands are shaking as well. And I also know that that beautiful girl right there in front of me, when her husband walks in the room, she doesn't look, um, she doesn't look very happy. So I put two and two together and I ask her what she does for work and she says she's a housewife and I say okay uh cool and I say how many kids and she says four and I go okay cool and as we're talking I realize that the reason she's got diarrhea and the reason that she's having all of these problems it's not because she could have cancer it's because she is a functioning alcoholic and is masking it and hiding it and nobody knows right so She's feeling like junk because there's a lot of deficiencies that go along with alcoholism. Like we have to give them a banana bag. That's, that's classic because that's got a lot of nutrients that are important uh, to someone who has been nutrient depleted. They're also going to present a different type of way as well. They're going to uh, be sometimes severely malnourished with proteins. Um, and also with essential fatty acids. So they have really, really patchy, thin hair, but it's masked with things like really expensive extensions. And people just don't know, right? 
So this is why I say these things, because sometimes we're going to have to know it as a nurse and we're going to have to be able to let a doctor know. Because remember, a lot of these doctors and a lot of these teaching hospitals are brand new and they don't know what we know, right? After a couple of years, you're going to realize it's your boss and you are going to see in September the new residents come through and you guys are going to laugh and it's going to be like, uh, like that... <laughs> This is so, okay, first off, I'm exaggerating. I'm totally over-exaggerating. I'm putting this on 10 out of 10, all right? Remember the remember the show, like, Scared Straight, where the teenage kids were, you know, coming in the door, and they're like, I'm hard. I, I hit my mama. And then, uh, like, the real the real people, they take them into their, into their ground, right? And they're all, like, barking at them, like, come at me, yo, right? Come here. I can't wait to meet you type of a deal. I think that's kind of how I feel about nurses when new residents come in. Because we all are sharks, honestly. Nurses are sharks. I know they're doctors, blah, 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 blah. Just, I need for you to trust and believe that what I'm saying is true. I have doctors who have looked at me and said, we have to go into so-and-so's room. You have to go with me. And I say, why? And they say, because I'm five foot five. You have to get, uh, you have to get in front of me because I'm afraid they're going to they're gonna try to charge at me. And I know you got it. I've had grown doctors. I'm not even joking. It happens all the time, all the time, all the time, because I guess I just have that look of, come at me, bro, right? I, I wish you would. I wish you would today. I guess I have that look about me, right? And uh, doctors, they, uh, the higher you go up in your hierarchical scale, the less work you do. I know that sounds crazy, but as a tech you will always know more than a nurse knows from the inside level, from the spirit source of a person. You will always know more than I know as a nurse. As a doctor, I know even less. And I do even less. And the thought, the thoughts that I have to take and the moves I have to make are even less. I'm not even going to lie because remember, I see it. I'm here, right? I do less movement and, and I take less action, but I put more thought into the actions of my movement, which dictates the movement of you, my techs, and everyone in between. So the way that I have to think is from a chess, chess master place versus I have to think as an action-based person as if I were a general in an army that were on the field. Does that make sense? So the, the way we change dynamic is different. So you guys need to know these pieces, every single one of them. I'm not even playing. I want you to know every single one of these. I need for you to know that there are A, B, and C deficiencies related to um, patches of hair. So like zinc, right? We need to know that that's zinc, but also that could be a protein deficiency, right? I need for you to be able to go boom, boom, boom. These are the ones that do that. I need for you to know that vitamin C's got to do with multiple, like uh, bruisey patches in multiple places, but it's also got to do with bleeding gums because the scurvy. Have you heard about the pirate movie? It's rated R. That was my my joke about scurvy and how I remembered that that's a vitamin C deficiency. Um, that was kind of nerdy. Okay, I, I figure I'll do this now. Vitamin C deficiency? Okay, great. Um, so uh, pirates uh, couldn't have citrus because it would spoil. And they had things that were, you know, more hardy to go on for the months on end. And the problem with that was is they didn't get uh, proper, appropriate uh, nutrients from the vitamin C. So they would get bleeding gums. And it was known as scurvy. And pirates were known to be disgusting and have cooties because of the scurvy all right because it was like gingivitis on on steroids right it was terrible so that's how you remember vitamin c deficiency scurvy right like um yeah there's your hack for vitamin c it laugh it up now but when you get the point you'll be happy that i just told you that so know all of these i would just get cards note cards and then put dry and scaly, scaly patches of hair loss essential fatty acids right? Zinc, patches of hair loss. If you see things like patches of hair loss, which I see three times on this slide, I would write protein, zinc, and fatty acids deficiency, patches of hair loss, and put it off to the side and memorize it. All right, I've talked enough about the slide. Next one. So I need for you guys to do me a favor and think less as students. Think more uh, of yourself as strategists. 
anytime you see a slide that has a point that is something called BMI nutrition, know from a strategist's perspective, your job is to know the BMI calculation, okay? This calculation is gonna come up and it's gonna come up for the rest of this program. It might be on one exam, it might be two or three questions for the entire semester, but that's two or three questions that you're gonna get points on that's gonna maybe make or break your ability to continue on through the program. Because remember, this gets harder as we go along. I am the mother hen that shows you the line that you need to walk into. And then once your feathers, you know, start to take on water and they start to get, you know, tighter and not so fluffy, right? And that lanugo comes off of them little buddies and the fuzz is off. At that point, I let you go. And then you've got to figure this out. And you're going to come crying to mama often. And I will put you back in line. But largely in part, it is your job to walk that line once I show you how that line is drawn, okay? When you see slides that say BMI nutrition, I need for you to memorize that calculation right then and there. It's going to come up, period. I'm not going to negotiate about it. I don't want to hear about you fussing about it. BMI is something that we look at often, okay? All right, so know how to calculate it. I would definitely know how to calculate it. And I would definitely know what underweight, normal weight, overweight, and obesity looks like, okay? You need to know all of those. I have seen often questions in the big three, and the big three is uh, NCLEX, standardized tests, and exit HESI. I have seen in all three of those the following types of questions. I have seen Sally who sells seashells by the seashore is 133.4 repeated kilograms and it's five foot five. What is their BMI? Calculate it. I have seen questions that says Sally who sells seashells by the seashore has a BMI of blank. What would that be considered? I have also seen Sally who sells seashells by the seashore who has a BMI of blank should be receiving education on blank. Ooh. All right. I gave you guys a lot of stuff to look at. You know those things, you're good to go. Quit stressing over it. It's okay. Next slide. Okie dokie, Smokies. So let me explain this slide. So um, I need for you to know that our order of operations for um, assessments is normally inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. When we're talking about the abdomen, it changes. It changes. It goes inspection, auscultation, palpation. Palpating before auscultating may alter the bowel sounds. Now, at one point in one of the labs, I said, no, that's not right. You don't, that doesn't change regardless. And the argument was, well, you don't want to palpate and mess with the bowels. And I was like, why have I never heard of this before? This is completely wrong. That used to be an old thing that we used to do, but it changed. And the reason it changed was because da 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 And the person who was telling me that looked at me really funny. And I thought, well, if they're looking at me funny, they're probably afraid to tell me that they've seen it. So I actually double checked it and I found out what happened. What happened was, is when I was doing uh, my surgical uh, residency portion of my clinicals that I had to finish in my doctoral program, um, I was working in gen surge and most of the patients that we saw in surgery and most of the people that we worked on, um, me and the, the general surgeon, um, we, we would see those patients on a GI area. So I would already have um, all my CTs, I would already have all of my x-rays or uh, KUBs or all of those imagings that I needed. I would already know what's going on with the patient. 
Now, what I didn't consider was that I'm I'm already, you know, doing order operations, inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. I'm doing it in that order because I already know what's wrong with the patient because I'm about to take him into surgery and we're about to we're about to operate on, right? Like so the dynamic is totally different when I'm looking at it from a surgical perspective because at that point my mentor uh, was a, a surgeon in Galleon, Ohio, and she taught me a whole ton. And man, what a fantastic gal, I tell you. Uh, so I, I was looking at it from that perspective and didn't understand why. And, and I remember even saying, well, that was the old way we did this. No, th that was your old role of doing this. So they were absolutely right. You need to go and consider the slide and make sure that you make your adjustments in your brain. Um, because this is always going to be uh, something that pops up as a new change in those big three examinations. Because I guess I'm not the only one that needed a clarifier with that. So remember it that way. All the other ones, inspection, palpation, percussion, auscultation. However, when we're doing the abdomen, all right, first off, they need to be lying supine quietly. I think that's pretty obvious, right? Uh, but also with the abdomen, it's inspection, auscultation, palpation. Palpate for auscultating. It might alter the bowel sounds. All right, friends, next slide. Okay, so bowel sounds. How long do we have to listen to each quadrant? Well, you have to listen to each quadrant for five minutes apiece, all right? Um, if there are no sounds, you have to listen five minutes each quadrant. Why do we have to do all four quadrants? Well, because you might listen to one, then go grab a doctor. Then the doctor goes and just listens to that one. And then they start to move because they've already assumed you've already done the three. Well, that's kind of a weird scenario, Molly. No, it's not. It just happened three months ago. <laughs> like, no, it happens all the time. I need for you to understand in your brain that as a nurse, the way that you understand the world around you, it's going to be like somebody turned on the light switch. And then put a cop light in your eye on top of it in pitch black. It's going to be like that type of difference once you get to the other side as a nurse. Because the way you think, the way you act around other people, the way you carry yourself, the way you present yourself to the public when you go to the grocery store, the way you see your friends, the way you choose your friends, the friends you keep, the friends that walk away, all of these things are going to be different. You think I'm joking. I'm not. When you go from being a hard individual, you know what I mean by that. My, my tribe, my group, and my institution that I work at, you guys, my students, y'all know how hard you are and y'all know how hard I am and this what makes us understand each other on a whole different level than a lot of other people because there is an environmental and cultural narrative that goes along with living a life of hard existence with struggle right when you struggle you don't feel like you're worth anything when you struggle you look at a you look at a $20 bill like your world just got made for the week okay now, now I look at myself and I stop myself every now and again because I say things like, oh, I just got offered a nursing contract to work three days a week, 12 hours a day, and they're only paying me $25.84 a week to take home. That's gross. I can't be bothered to do that. I, you think I'm joking. I just did it this morning. I just did it this morning. I used to go from being what I told you guys that I was and living that hard to being so bougie that I'm walking away from these contracts because I'd rather sit here and talk with you guys because I'm doing just fine. And I can sit back and I can play a little bit. And I'd rather play with you guys and teach you something then go out there and make stupid funny money and complain about it being not enough. That's how different my life is. I went from wondering how I was going to feed my babies to, <laughs> to complaining about making more than most people will ever see on 
one salary in one household family in their lifetime. It sounds boastful, but it's not. Right now, I'm ashamed. I'm grateful. I've, I've crawled out of hell, right? I've done the dirt. I'm here. I've earned it. And yet, somehow, I'm still, I still feel shame because that's how different my life is and it's that big of an adjustment and I'm trying to teach you that in two years I'm trying to teach you 10 years of transition in two years because that's all the time I got I actually got less I got uh, average 15 months between you guys some even less so heed my words and listen please I say these things for a reason I want you to be where I am and I want you to influence others just as I hopefully have influenced you right my, my crown achievement was when I graduated my first group of students that I, um, that I ever interacted with in a clinical setting. I graduated those guys this last time and that was my crowning achievement was that I finally had spread the message to a, a gang of my babies um, and it's only getting richer every time you guys go through. So let's get you guys through too. Cool. All right, I've talked for four minutes and 50 seconds and haven't even talked about what we need to do here. So five minutes each quadrant. There may be no bowel sounds for up to four minutes or more, all right, because sometimes there's not enough. Uh, they are usually high-pitched gurgles. Report absences to the doc. We just talked about that. Um, mechanical obstruction, paralytic ileus, peritonitis. Those are the problems that we have related to no bowel sounds. Paralytic ileus uh, will become an ischemic bowel and if it gets bad enough, and we die from that. Bowel obstruction, we die from that. Peritonitis, we could theoretically go into sepsis and die from that. It's a big deal, all right? Um, I need for you to know the audible sounds that uh, are hyperactive. And I need for you to know you have to palpate all four quadrants because those are all common sense things that we have to, we have to be able to establish. So we can go to the next slide. All right, lots of GI on this one. So when we're talking about abdominal assessment and you see normal and abnormal, you know where this is going to go. I might change this because I, mm, this red on this black is looking weird towards the bottom. Mm. I might change the color of these. Right now they're green and red, but this red is so wonky on top of this black that I kind of feel like some of you guys are going to have trouble reading it. Eh, probably not. Eh, yeah, I'll keep it. All right, so complain about it and let me know, and I'll change it if I need to and just, you know, redo the slide. So normal. You need to know the difference between normal and abnormal sounds. Bottom line. So on a foundations level, on a fundamentals level, on a health assessment level, they're going to ask you to know constantly what's normal and abnormal of all of these different assessments that we do. So know your normals, right? Know your abnormals. Specifically, anytime we see conditions of health that are uh, severe and deterioration and um, also consistently quick in their deterioration of their disease process, AKA jaundice, right? That can mess things up really quick. So I need for you to know that it might in indicate liver disease. And I need for you to know that their abdomen is gonna be distended. It's gonna be taut. In other words, if you thump it, it's gonna go versus, right? It's going to sound differently because there's going to be a lot of fluid. That's ascites. Ascites is fluid on the gut. Okay. They're going to have kaput medusae. Ooh, big words. All right. So medusae is like medusa and medusa has what for hair? Snakes. So it literally looks like veins that look like hair of medusa because that is literally the Latin translation, translation of kaput medusae. I told you, it's fun to be a nerd. It's fun to know Latin. It's fun to look outside, you know, the world and see anything other than Talk Soup, Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, uh, whatever your local news station is that lets you know about every ungodly thing that happens, but nothing ever good. 
And, you know, the Kardashians, I suppose. Is that still a thing? Was that ever a thing? I don't even know. Um, that's, that's all I got. So please understand, sometimes we make it so easy and all you got to do is just be able to translate it. So again, kaput, C-A-P-U-T, just in case you guys need to know that because it does show up on exams. C-A-P-U-T, I think that's right. M -A yes. So it's C-A-P-U-T-M-E-D-U-S-A-E, -E, two different words. It's a cluster of swollen veins in your abdomen. If you Google images it, you'll be like, oh yeah, that totally looks like Medusa snakes because not only is it kind of bluish grayish tinged, but it's risen from the surface of the tissue and they're engorged, they're huge. And they're so squiggly because remember, um, these veins as they're very, very tight and they're very uh, cylindrical, right? They're very, very good. Like they're as tight as a PVC pipe sometimes, uh, but a very silicon feel to them, right? So it's like silicone, they're squishy um, and they're kind of bendable and flexible, but they usually stand pretty straight. Now, when you blow them up, all of those tissues, all of those fibers, all of those networks that were zippered together in that tissue so that they can't break apart, all of those have pop, 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 popped open. So that's why when you see these people who are on anabolic steroids, their veins and their arms go from being super straight and pretty. And then after 10 years of use or five years of use, you see them and they're like weird zigzag mountain ranges, kind of like you're driving down a massive mountain, just kind of looped all over the place. Right. That's what happens. It pops so many fibers. It can no longer hold that structure and it just collapses on itself. Right. So that's what it looks like. Give it a Google images, burn it in your brain. You're only going to have to see it once to understand it. Now that I've told you all of those things. Okay. And then know that that is a problem with progressive liver disease and that they are going to be jaundiced. Matter of fact, most of the pictures you see are, they're going to be jaundiced in the pictures. Okay. Um, there should be no displacement of the umbilicus. The umbilicus is the umbilical area, the, uh, the belly button, basically. Hernias should not be visible in the umbilicus. If they have an umbilical hernia, this is usually indicative of uh, multiple pregnancies from a female. Sometimes uh, gentlemen get it. If it happens at birth, it usually isn't that big of a deal. They just usually watch it. Uh, so there's those pieces and parts that usually show up. Inverted umbilicus is increased abdominal pressure, usually from ascites or a large mass. Again, in pregnancy, we see these things. All right. So if we see them, we need to note them and we need to let the doctor know because they need to be doing some other testing, obviously. Glistening or taut appearance. With ascites, ascites is a big deal. They usually do, uh, there are a lot of interrogation tests that you do to confirm ascites. One of them is to sit at the head of the bed and kind of reach over them and wave to one side the belly and it will slosh back and forth like a pull wave sloshing back and forth in a shallow body of water. No joke, that's a thing. Um, so know that that is associated with ascites. No pulsation between the umbilicus and the pubis um, indicates an aortic, uh, an abdominal aortic aneurysm. You should not, I repeat, not, one more time, Nikola Tesla, should not be able to lay down flat, look at your belly and see thump, thump, thump coming from that area. That is an indicator of something very serious. Now, if you're in bathtub and you're really, really skinny, okay, I love how uh, Professor Rickert put this. Um, he, he said, if you are very, very thin and laying down flat in a hot tub and you see the thump, 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 or you're, you know, eight months pregnant and you see the thump, 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 don't freak out about that. That could be because, you know, it's positional and you're in a body of water and it's hot. So we are going to um, rise all of that to the surface. And then if you're that tiny, you could theoretically see a thump. I've seen it before. It's nothing to worry about. I've seen it in pregnancy. It's nothing to worry about. If you see it just, you know, Joe Blow sitting around, that's a big problem. You got to do something about that. Okay. And then uh, let's see. Again, permanent patterns of engorgement is a big problem. Um, again, we're looking at issues related to ascites, issues related to a couple of other things potentially. 
In patients with portal hypertension, veins are dilated and gorged and appear to radiate from the umbilicus. Again, these are big baddies. These are big no-nos. So know that with portal hypertension, this happens. And then we can go to the next slide. If you ever memorize a slide in your entire life, it better be this one. How about that for starting off a slide? If you have ever in your life memorized a slide, this is a slide you need to memorize. I'm not even joking. This is going to be something you need to know in long-term processing for the rest of your career here and the rest of your career as a nurse. Period, point, paragraph. No exceptions. Non-negotiable. So just go ahead and make the slides. Make yourselves note cards. Tricuspid valve sounds are best heard where. Pulmonic valve sounds are best heard where. Mitral, best heard where. Aortic valve, best heard where. Okay? Also know the first heart sound, S1, is the beginning of systole. And the second one is the beginning of diastole or diastole. However you pronounce it, I've heard both. Okay? Know that. Know the PMI or porno maximal impulse where the apical pulse is palpated because they're interchangeable is normally located in the fourth or fifth intercostal space at the mid clavicular line. Okay. Know the second aortic sound may be heard at herbs point, which is located at the third intercostal space just left of the sternum. I have no joke given you, I'm not even playing. I should not even say these things. I might get in trouble. I've literally given you the answer to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, questions that you were going to get in your career at any nursing institution in this entire nation, I would argue globally, because I have limited evidence, but enough to support that these are all going to be questions at some point in your career, if not sooner than later. So know it, burn it in your brain for the rest of your life as a nurse, forever and ever. Amen to the creators. All right, next slide. Related to the abdomen, a pericardial friction rub could be one of the worst, well, related to the thorax, really, but related to the trunk. How about that? Related to um, the abdomen. Uh, a pericardial friction rub is probably one of the bigger deals. All right. Two classic findings of pericarditis, which is inflammation of the pericardium. Look at where the pericardium is. Um, we will have chest pain, obviously, and we will have a pericardial friction rub. Know that. Just know it. Know that it sounds like sandpaper and scratching because it does. It really does. Um, hmm. Ooh, I can make the sound. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Brain blast. Okay. You're going to have to listen really close. But I think I can, ooh, I can almost make it. Yep, got it. Okay, here's what it sounds like. You ready? That is me getting cardstock and rolling it over the um, spiral binder. That's what it sounds like. It's, it sounds like you're rubbing sandpaper together, but very finely. Sometimes it can be very, very harsh. Those guys usually are in a ton of pain, okay? Um, know that systolic murmurs are a thing and where the obstruction is, okay? And know that it has to do with an incompetent atrioventricular valve, all right? Know that an S3 is heard in heart failure. Know that an S4 is heard when there's hypertrophy of a ventricle. Okay. Fair enough. I think those are fair enough. All right, let's go to the next slide. Now, this is the shortest slide in the world because we talked about things related to cardiac output and the assessment findings that you would see in people with decreased cardiac output. So you know that they're going to be a little more fatigued. You know that sometimes when you have decreased cardiac output, 
um, you are going to have um, a, a dysregulation of blood pressure and heart rate as a result of that. You know that uh, you could potentially get congestive heart failure. So in your assessment, you're going to look at things like capillary refill that's increased above three seconds, right? Things of that nature. What I did not mention is that you need to know that there's going to be pallor in the buccal mucosa. So when we do our assessment, we need to check the buccal mucosa because that is going to indicate pallor, which is going to let us know that this could be decreased cardiac output if we've already ruled out, you know, lung issues. And again, even if it is a lung issue, what is that more than likely related to? Is it a lung deficiency or is it a problem with circulation and transfer and getting enough oxygenation appropriated to the brain like it needs to, to function like it should, right? That, that could also be indicative of a decrease in cardiac output. So they might have, you know, a little bit of confusion, things of that nature. We talked about those things as well. But specifically, remember, there is also going to be pallor in the buccal mucosa. All right, next slide. Anytime that we talk about uh, lab levels for risk of cardiovascular upset, we are always going to talk about several things, but they're always the same stuff. All right, so we're going to talk about a lipid panel. And a lipid panel has many names, if I'm honest. It could be like a cholesterol panel, a coronary risk panel, a fasting lipid panel, or a non-fasting lipid panel. There's lipid tests, there's lipid profile. It's got many names, but it's always the same stuff, right? So it's got total cholesterol. Total cholesterol is your overall cholesterol level. Uh, it's a combination of like your LDL, your VLDL, and your HDL. I'll get into that in a second. Calm down. It's okay. Um, so you've got your LDL and you've got your VLDL and then you've got your HDL and then you've got your triglycerides. Those are the pieces and parts. So when you're talking about LDL, LDL is known as the bad cholesterol. It collects in your blood vessels and increases your risk of cardiovascular disease, da, 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 da. All right. VLDL. It's the type of cholesterol that usually, um, is present in low amounts when the blood sample is like fasting, uh, because it comes from things that you've recently eaten, all right? So an increase in that type of cholesterol in a fasting sample, it's a sign of abnormal metabolism, usually. You've got your HDL, which is your good cholesterol, right? It helps you decrease the buildup of LDL in your blood vessels, all right? Then you have triglycerides, and it's the type of fat from the food that we eat, right? Excess amounts of triglycerides are known um, in your blood and is associated with cardiovascular disease. Um, also pancreatic inflammation, which is why we're talking about things like lipase. Because lipase and amylase is something that we do for a panel related to a pancreatic upset, as well as other things. But usually we check an amylase and a lipase. So you have got to know these labs. I don't even know how to tell you how much you were going to miss out on your entire program and how many points you were going to absolutely lose in this entire program and how many points you're going to lose on your NCLEX because you don't know your labs. These labs come up often. Anytime we talk about cardiovascular stuff, we're always going to do these things. As a doctor of nursing practice, when I have a patient who comes in with chest pain, I am going to do the following. Immediate EKG. I'm going to do immediate troponin levels in a series of three. A series of three means I'm going to do this every X amount of hours, okay, to see if those enzymes uh, represent uh, an increase in cellular death. So that way I can call this an STEMI or whatever, right? So that's always going to be one that I get. I'm always going to get um, a lipid panel, which is what I commonly call it and a couple of other things that you don't need to concern yourself with right this second. But here's how I remember, okay, we just talked about VLDL, LDL, HDL, and triglycerides. Triglycerides are usually something that we look at last as far as an answer is concerned on these standardized tests, because what you need to know, that they want you to know that you know from a credentials perspective, for a licensure perspective, is that you know the difference between LDL and HDL. This is a bigger piece. LDL, and HDL are always mixed up. I can't tell you how many times people have mixed it up. And I found out a way to not mix it up. 
because you know I have a hack for just about everything. So you ready for this? LDL. I want you to write L for lethal because it will kill you. L for lethal. HDL. H for healthy. Now you're never going to mix them up. So what do you need to know specific to LDL and HDL? Well, you need to know that uh, LDLs are more directly associated with a cardiovascular upset, current cardi cardio, uh, cardiovascular disease, things of that nature. Um, and I'm not going to worry you with the levels right this second, because from a, from a health assessment level, you just need to know what it is versus the pieces and parts you're going to learn about later on in life. Uh, when you get into the med surges, you need to know about levels and what that represents because it's going to ask you, hey, we have an LDL of this. Is this something I need to be concerned with, right? So, eh, all right, fine. Here we go. I'm going to give it to you anyways. So total cholesterol needs to be below 200. And total cholesterol means of all of these, what is the net yield? So when I add and subtract all the variables, what's my final number? It needs to be below 200. Your HDL, that you're healthy, or high-density lipoprotein is what it stands for, actually. It's supposed to be above 60. So if it's below 60, that's bad. If it's above 60, that's good. All right, your LDL is called low-density protein or low-density lipoprotein. And it is supposed to be below 100. So if I have an LDL of 121, that's not good, okay? Okay. For people who have diabetes, uh, they want you to have it below 70, just as an FYI. And triglycerides is usually 150. Um, below 150 is our benchmark for that, is what we're trying to achieve, okay? So when we have people that have increases in LDL, we're always going to put them on a statin. So know that as well. If we have a very high LDL, this patient's going to go on a statin, period. Okay, we usually use the Torvastatin or what they call Lipitor. You don't need to know that right now. You might for farm, but that's later on in life. Uh, and we usually start off with a singular dose and then we bump up to a double if it's, if it's necessitated. Uh, people don't like to take that medication because they get leg cramps. So they'll start taking it and then they end up dying of cardiovascular upset. So I'll take the leg cramps. But again, um, everyone's a little bit different. So you need to know that LDLs are more directly associated with cardiovascular disease and other lipoproteins because it's lethal, duh. Um, they have a higher predictive association with cardiovascular disease than, um, than levels of triglycerides alone. Uh, lipase, that's the digestive enzyme that breaks down ingested fats in the gastrointestinal um, tract, which is why the pancreas is affected by these. Okay, you need to know that. Low levels of testosterone, they have a significantly negative influence on coronary artery disease. All right, so then... As long as we get those pieces and parts together and understand all of those things that we just talked about, you'll be good. So let's jump to the next slide. So all of you have met me very well, and you know that when I put things in slides, I've thought about it, and it's been a cold and calculative move um, that has been an effort put forth through experience. So some of these bullet points that are on the slide, you're going to go, well, yeah, duh, but no, let me explain why. So first off, uh, in the reproductive sense, hair distribution varies, usually covers an inverse triangle with the base over the mons pubis. Some hair may extend to the midline towards the umbilicus. This is a normal finding. Some women shave their pubic hair as a matter of preference. Well, no dip, Sherlock. Why did you bother to put that in? Well, I'll tell you why. Because I have to read reports all the time where someone puts in there that lady parts have been shaved. Okay, what, 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 why do I need that in h and Why? 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 It's because you're a brand new baby and you don't know what you're doing. All right. So don't, don't, don't make someone giggle by putting this in here. Please don't. Because this is a normal finding. All right. Again, when it's found, it's a normal variation. Skin should be smooth and clear, right? 
Notice any uh, male hair distribution or diamond shape pattern or patchy loss of hair or absence of hair? Because this can be indicative, again, of uh, a vitamin deficiency that we talked about. And there's three of them that are related to patches of hair. That includes the pubic area. All right. So that could be another indicator or um, it could be, you know, just genetics taking its taking its ride. I mean, whatever the deal is, that needs to be annotated, right? Because that's going to be a difference or, or an abnormal finding. Um, observe for presence of skin lesions or infestations of skin or pubic hair, right? That's a thing. You're going to see that in a hospital setting. Everyone freaks out when there's lice. Let me tell you, it's a parasite. Here's the deal. It's very simple. These guys, everyone freaks out about bed bugs. And everyone freaks out about lice, but everyone needs to stop. And here's why. Because it's a bug, much like any other bug that you have in your yard. The difference is it's a parasite and it likes the scalp because it's easy to penetrate and it sucks blood, but lots of things suck blood, right? So then why is it so freaky? Because it's different, because it's gross. Like I get it, but don't treat them different. Here's the deal. So this one's pretty particularly bothersome to me because every kid gets it in daycare, right? Like it's a thing. One of my four kids have absolutely gotten this. Um, at one time I was uh, also a foster mom and I had multiple kids. And at one time uh, between me and <clears throat> you know my, my ex-spouse, we had 12. Um, 12 kids total. So it was, there was a lot between the two of us going on at any given moment. So when one gets it, they all get it, right? It doesn't mean that somebody's dirty, right? It, geez, Minnie's Louise. I, I was living in a, a total square footage house of 10,000 square foot on 15 acres of land in a very, very good area, um, in a very beautiful home. Right, you had a heated driveway that was a, a nearly a, a half a mile long, and and seven car garage. Just sounds like living the king life, right? Okay, cool. I also had in the home at that time multiple children who I was trying to you know get this this thing out because they went to school and then they went to a sleepover and then boom, there you go, right? So let's treat lice a little bit differently. Like, I don't know why we got so much hate for this stuff or we think that someone's icky because a bug might get into your head. It's pretty simple. Just don't put your head against theirs and you should be okay. I don't know. Do you put your head up on patients most often? Like, I don't. So quit freaking out. They don't jump. They're not projectile jumpers, right? Like, read up on these things. Don't let them freak you out. So we have to have PPE for those type of people. You need to know that. Um, we encourage everyone to wear hair nets, hair nets, hair nets for the nets. How about that? While you're treating these patients, they start to treat them in the emergency department. If they can, they call it a decomp for decomposition or we are, uh, decontaminating as well. Um, and we are trying to decompensate the level of, you know, lice that you have in your head. But once they get up to your floor, you still have to continue this treatment. And you also have to get the nits out because then they're just going to hatch. Like, I know these are really gross things to talk about. And if it disturb you, dir disturbs you, like, you know, switch to the next slide. But bottom line is, is you got to do this stuff because this happens no matter where you go, no matter what your patient population is, it's going to be a thing every now and again. It doesn't happen often. It's probably eh, once every three months, but it does happen. If it's done in the ED, it happens probably eh, once every two to three weeks, right? So you can't get, you can't get ugly with somebody over that. I've had it as a kid. We have it a lot as a kid where I grew up because, you know, we lived in poverty and I, I often joke that we were feral children in the last group of feral children because that is very real. That is very, very real. Like, uh, I, half the time my dad didn't even know where I was, right? Because we just were able to roam about freely, whatever that looks like. Uh, so long as we were back at, you know, at dark. So whatever we got into throughout the day, it didn't matter. It was ours to have and our memories to keep. Um, that has now changed. Uh, so things like lice is getting better, but it's still a problem. So don't freak out when you get around it. 
treat them normal because people will make sounds and they'll gag and it'll be like fake gagging, not like you can't help it gagging. And people in the hospital room, those doors are really thick doors, but Jesus, you can still hear people making comments as soon as they shut the door. I've heard it. I've yelled at people over it. If you're a good nurse, you'll yell at people when you hear it. I'm physically yell because you know what? If they got the nerve to get in somebody's face and make fun of them because somebody's got lice behind that door, then I got the nerve to get up in your face as who I am. And you get to look me dead square in the eye and you get to tell me about my shame, right? Good luck with that. <laughs> good luck with that because like Tupac said, only God can judge me now. Yikes. Come at me, bro. I wish. I wish you would. This is the type of nurse I want you to be. I want you to protect the innocent. I want you to lead a nation of broken people because we are broken. We are all broken. And the sooner we remember that and believe that as gospel, the sooner we can get off our freaking high horses and get back down to gravity and the ground like we should be with the rest of the people because that's what people need. They need a leader to stand with them and not away from them, all right? Know that candidia infections are red. Know that there are eroded patches with scaling and pustules, and this is not a normal finding. Notice uh, that we also have, it's associated with immobility, systemic antibiotics, and immunologic deficits. Know that. Know those things. All right? You're going to have to, in a lot of these scenarios, find the abnormal finding. So you need to know the difference in what is and what isn't. And sometimes it might surprise you. All right, next slide. Okay, let's talk pulses. Bottom line, you need to know where the pulses are. You need to know popliteal pulse is behind the knee. You need to know temporal pulse is over the temporal bone. Period, point, paragraph. Memorize them. Put them on note cards. You're going to need to know this for the rest of your career. All right, next slide. All right, so there are different types of defibrillators, and I put this in here because we talk a lot about AEDs. We don't talk a lot about ICDs, and ICDs are going to be something that we talk about when we're dealing with cardiovascular units, but it's also going to be something that happens with a lot of your patients. So I'm going to start with ICDs, and then we're going to go into what it does, what you'll normally see, and then we'll bump over to AEDs and then run over that really quick, and you need to know the difference between the two, okay? So um, basically, ICDs, it's an implantable cardioverter or defibrillator, or an automated implantable cardio defibrillator, uh, cardioverter. It's an implantable device inside the body. It performs defibrillation. Um, it paces the heart. It does many things. So what are all those pieces and parts mean? Basically, it means the people who live with left ventricular dysfunction, right? Think about the left ventricle and where that sits. And think about how important that is. Remember how I told you if I had a right atria um, and there was a dysfunction there, its job is pretty lazy in comparison to a left, ventric or a left ventricle. Because a left ventricle, remember, when we're dealing with um, the washing machine theory and the way the cardiac system works, is their job is to then take that and spread it out to the rest of the body. So if I have left ventricular dysfunction, it's a big deal, right? So it, uh, it means that they're at an increased risk of sudden cardiac death, secondary to ventricular tachycardias or tachydysrhythmias, all right? So it increases with the decreasing ejection fraction or the push that we push that blood with, right, that percentage, it decreases with the left ventricular ejection fraction. So people who've experienced sustained ventricular tachy tachyarrhythmias or unexplained syncopal episodes are at great risk for sudden cardiac death. Now the ICD, it's the device that's capable of detecting and determining the ventricular tachydysrhythmias, right? And then it corrects it by way of a, a manual shock if needed um, or we can also set it to demand pace, so it will kick on and, and start to regulate the rhythm if, for whatever reason, I go below a certain line that I set, all right? So there's two different types. There's a single chamber ICD. It's a single defibrillator lead implanted in the right ventricle 
whereas the dual chamber ICD has a right atrial pacing lead and a right ventricular defibrillating lead, okay? It's called a biventricular ICD, two ventricles, biventricular, it hits both, right? It's also known as like a CRT defibrillator. Um, it has a right defibrillator, nope, has a right ventricular defibrillator lead and a left ventricular pacing lead uh, placed via usually the coronary sinus, okay? So depending on what type of issue they have depends on the placement of it, obviously. And you can see this implantable device in uh, things like x-rays. They're pretty, pretty simple to see there. Now you got to be really careful. There are things that you have to, you know, watch out for. Um, like you have to stay so many feet away from generators. You got to stay so many feet away from this and that and the other. You got to watch out for this, ba da 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 all right? Because this is all using electromagnetics. Like when a person dies, this, uh, sometimes this pacemaker, depending on what type it is, will continue to shock the patient. So you have to put a magnet on top of their chest while they're passing. You also, if they are being cremated, have to let them know that they have an ICD in there. Okay. Um, so there's a lot involved with them. So there are many, many different people who make this. Let's see, there's Medtronic, there's Boston Scientific, there's Biotronic, there's Colbach, there's uh, Levanova, there's Chrome, there's Evra MRI ICD, there's um, Sprint Quattro, I'm probably missing some. And you will have a representative uh, on a cardiac unit that works pretty closely in relation to you whenever someone gets a new ICD uh, or, or what they call an ICD pacemaker type of, of, of deal. Um, ICDs are super important. However, there's a lot of risk involved with it uh, because when they put it in, you can't lift so much. You have to be in a sling for so long. Um, it gets a little hairy because there's a lot of infection risk. Da, 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 da. Uh, do people get through it? Yeah, it's fine. Um, is it incredibly painful? Eh, not really. They tell me usually about a five. Uh, these, these representatives will help you troubleshoot um, issues that they have on their end with their computer systems. And they're actually in the cath lab tweaking uh, the pacemaker or tweaking um, whatever it is that they are using as an implantable device. Um, as the surgery is going on. So they sit at the head of surgery um, and they're scrubbed up and they're wearing lead, right? Um, just like I would be, just like, you know, my interventional cardiologist is. So their job's pretty cool. Now, how is that different from an AED? Well, an AED is the big box that we grab when we're talking about BLS. You go call the police. You grab an AED. That, you remember those, those, uh, those quotes that we have to give out, those lines? that we have to recite in our script. So that is something that is a box and you use that as an automated external defibrillator. Um, and that is something that we use in ACLS protocol as well. So those are the difference in the two devices. Um, and that's kind of uh, a picture of what that looks like from the inside. And then you just need to know the difference between the two and then we will go to the next slide. All right, so here's the deal. Um, CPR. CPR, we have BLS and we have advanced care life support. BLS is your basic life support. So basically it's built on the idea of we need to, um, we need to be doing compressions and we need to uh, promote the best circulation possible. Whereas advanced care life support, we're usually in a better situation. The patient is usually at bedside and they crash and we have our crash cart with us. We give meds. Uh, we give drugs so often. We also have other uh, interventional modalities. We have things like magnesium we can give the patient, bicarb. Um, there's a lot of things that we do. So we're actively involved with an AED machine that is properly going. Sometimes we're throwing interosseous leads, uh, which is, you know, in their leg. We're throwing, um, uh, we're throwing lines in to people in very bizarre places. Uh, we got lab that's sitting in there that's also drawing labs while we're, you know, compressing this patient and doing all these other crazy things. There's 20 people in the room, that type of a deal. All right, that's ACLS. So just know the difference between the two. Know what CPR is and know that either way, our job is to retroactivate circulation 
which means bring back circulation from whence it came. And that's, that is what our objective is, is to have continual um, circulation throughout the body of that blood supply by way of uh, manually um, compressing, right? And making the heart do its job when it decides not to do it for itself. Next slide. All right, so peripheral artery disease. This is something that happens often enough. Um, it's legs, lower extremities, narrowing or blockage of the vessels that carries the blood from the heart to the legs. So a big deal. Um, it's primary or primarily caused by the buildup of fatty plaques in the arteries, which is called atherosclerosis. Your common assessment finding because of this, because there's you know something in the way, it's occluding. The, the, the ability for the feet and legs to properly have vascularization through that area, which means it's not going to be able to move as well. And as a defense mechanism, our body says, hey, guess what? Pain. Ouch. Hey, dummy, do something. Something's wrong. Our body sends pain signals as a warning shot of if you don't fix this quickly, then something bad's going to happen. So know that part of the assessment findings are going to include capillary refill over three seconds. Know there's going to be pain, aching, heaviness, cramping in your legs whenever you walk or you climb. Know that there is something called claudication versus intermittent claudication. Full on claudication means if I take any step at all, it's going to hurt. And the reason that it hurts is because think about it, you need to take steps in order to circulate things around your body. As you step, your muscles squeeze. And as things squeeze, part of the squeezing is a stimulation, uh, a, a stimulation source for that blood to then shoot up like it's supposed to, right? It's kind of the same way we, you know, have a, a venous insufficiency and we kick our legs up and then we get all that fluid back, uh, we get all that blood and accumulation and fluid back to the trunk again, right? So that's why we raise them above the level of the heart. That's why we wear um, our stockings when we have venous insufficiency versus peripheral artery disease. In peripheral artery disease, you're not wearing compression stockings because it's already compressed and that's the problem. Okay, so we need to open that up and encourage it and we make you walk. So you're going to hurt walking and we tell you walk through the pain. I cannot make these things up. A lot of times you need a vascular surgeon because a lot of times this is a result of um, something in the femoral artery that's getting occluded and you might need a stent. There are other areas, but that's you know, one of the common areas or an iliac area, right? That's another one. So we need to have that taken care of. Also, um, you uh, will have problems like a leg hair may stop growing, right? Uh, one foot may feel colder than the other. Cold feet are definitely a thing. If you have peripheral artery disease, know that you are absolutely going to have to have a venous Doppler on this patient. I don't care if you have a vascular surgeon, they don't care if you can feel it on your fingers. They want to hear it and put that you have found it on Doppler for the love of Pete. So you document an epic, both of those things, because they want to know how well this leg is going. If we got a cold leg, that's not good. So peripheral artery disease, much more, much more serious. We get the black toes from these people. We get the no feet. Uh, or no feeling in our feet, these are the same people. And again, you can't feel anything if it's dying because it doesn't have any circulation. It's not getting any life to it. It's not getting fed, all right? So know the difference in the two. With peripheral artery disease, we are not going to put on stockings. With venous insufficiency, we will. We're gonna have varicose veins with venous insufficiency. We're not with peripheral artery disease. Peripheral artery disease, we're not gonna have any hair. Because if the job of that blood is to supply hair follicle or to supply a pulse, what do you think it's going to supply, right? Our, our creators have worked very, very hard to create us. Whatever that creator looks like for you, right? It's just as good as my creator, I promise. So the deal is, is they worked really hard in their due diligence to make sure that under any circumstance we can sustain life. Because that's how much our, my, our life means to us, to our creator. 
whoever that looks like, respectively, whoever they are, whoever that person is or that being is, however many there are, bottom line. So know the difference in the two and know uh, the backup system. Also, venous stasis ulcers, you would still wear, wear Ted Hopes for those because the problem is the accumulation of fluid super saturating these cells of these tissues and then breaking them open. That's how you get these venous insufficiencies. So when you elevate your feet and when you put on those Ted hose, it dries essentially those cells and tissue creates new ones over time and doesn't allow those to be super saturated. It would be the equivalent of that cell trying to drink a gallon of water that's being tossed upside down in its face. You just can't gulp it fast enough. I hope that makes sense to you. Let's look at the next slide. Know that wherever the heart goes, the lungs will follow. And know wherever the heart goes, the kidneys will be there. So the heart and the lungs are, uh, inter are very connected and correlated. I would say the heart and the lungs are uh, a partnership or a union between two people, whatever that looks like, however that looks like in your brain. And then the kidneys would be the twins, all right? So whatever the heart does, the lungs are gonna be directly affecting and also whatever the heart does is gonna directly affect the, the livelihood of those twins, of those kidneys, all right? So when you have kidney failure, your kidneys won't filter the blood the way it should, all right? So as a result, those toxins and waste build up in your bloodstream and cause toxicity to your blood. All right, so dialysis is necessary. You also have accumulation of uh, your nutrients, your electrolytes like potassium. So I will get people who need dialysis and skip dialysis because I don't want to go and waste my life away. So I'm going to go sit in my house and waste my life away. I, 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 like I can't make these things up. I had one person one time tell me that they didn't want to go to dialysis because it encroached on their personal space and time. And I said, cool, what do you do for a living? Well, I don't work. What do you do at home? Well, I like to watch my shows. Okay, we got shows here. I know, but everyone just blocks me from it. Okay, cool. Are you blocked from your shows or are you being distracted by society, which is a piece of part of something that you want to be a part of, but you feel like you can't because you have no control because I'm making you come here to sustain your life. Ooh, that's a big talk to have. And listen, I clock it like I clock and I'm good at what I do. I'm not, it's not even about being a nurse, right? I'm a good nurse because I clock people well. Because I've been clocking people since the day I was born. Because that's just what it is to, to be me and be wired the way I'm wired, right? It's my advantage. My curse to the world is I don't understand human condition, although I've studied it my entire life. So I know how you act and I know how you are acting and why you're acting the way you're act. Heck, I even know what to say to counter whatever thought that you're having that's negative and, and turning it and transmuting it into a positive action and thought that leads you into being very successful. I'm very good at all those things. But what I stink at is having an interpersonal relationship because I'm so used to masking, all right? So I need for you to look at this from that type of a level if you do have a dialysis patient because it's kind of like they too have autism spectrum disorder in their own little way because again it's not that they don't want to be a part of society it's that they fear what society is going to have for them when they see what it is that they present to society all right i am more fearful looking like a king cobra right because i hate snakes so that's why i like to add those in I look like a king cobra ready to go ahead and, and attack and bite, right? Like that's how smooth as glass as I look walking down the hallway. But on the inside, all I think is, are they going to like me? Am I influencing the way that they're learning? Am I fostering their development and care, right? I don't think about, hey, I like that person's scrubs or I like their makeup or their hair looks really nice. No, I'm not thinking any of those things because that's not the way my brain wires it's very bizarre it's kind of that's why people kind of laugh and you know call me the robot or the cyborg because i don't think like i think like a vulcan right 
human emotions are nothing more than chemical mediators firing off and telling me to feel a certain type of way. If I say don't feel that way, then I can, I can change it. I can transmute it. So then at that point, what is emotion? What is it to emote? What is it to, what is, what is love, right? Baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me no more. I'm just saying, like, uh, when you deal with things like that and you look at things for the reality that it is, this is, this is what we got. And it may be bleak or meaningless, but either way, you're going to have patients that don't understand society all of a sudden. And for someone who has been in society and is an extrovert and loves people, which is the polar opposite of what I am, even though people think I'm an extrovert, I'm not. I'm actually a hardcore introvert, all right? It does something to a person. Like, it, it breaks their soul. So you've got to be part of their Jiminy Cricket that motivates them and finds their meaning in life again, right? Because thoughts are fleeting, but actions taken during thoughts that are fleeting are permanent. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Life is very, life is very important. Um, and people should find importance in their existence. Even if their existence doesn't really mean much in the grand scheme of life, I think part of this sandbox that is this playing ground that is this school of life that's supposed to teach us something bigger and we're supposed to move on to this next level of understanding, whatever it is that this world uh, seeks to help us find, um, again, the core of our soul wants to be integrated in society and feel validated in our own existence for the most part right so remind them i don't expect everyone to think on my level i don't expect anybody to think on my level to be fair i know it's bizarre i know it's weird but i know it's also things that we think from a deep dark secretive perspective maybe a little closed space in our brain a little small closet that we shut because it's just too much for us to manage I challenge that we think about these things and talk about it actively. It's there. It's here. It's part of the medicine we keep. So let's make it part of our understanding and studies. So dialysis patients, be very, very careful with them. They're very, very, uh, I don't want to say unstable because lots of them are fantastic. But in the very beginning, at least, it can get a little hairy, especially towards the end. It gets a little hairy all over again because they get into this give up phase. Remember, if they want to give up, let them. Don't, don't tell a person what to do or how to feel or how to act or how to live. Don't. Let them. But be their biggest cheerleader while they do it. If they want to fight, be there for them and be their biggest cheerleader to fight. We have to separate ourselves from what we would do versus what they would do. You're always going to get asked, what would you do? And your answer is... What I would do and what you would do are always going to be two grossly different operations because we think very differently. So that's not my place. What does your heart tell you to do? What does your gut tell you to do? What does your brain tell you to do? Who matters more? That's what I say. And that makes it a little bit easier to make a decision. But I always end off with this note to know that they know that you know that you've got their back. And you do that by saying, but listen, whatever you choose, Good, bad, indifferent, be it death and dying or fight until the wheels fall off, I'm right here with you. Whatever that looks like, I don't care. As soon as you tell them that, they know what they're going to do. And you're that one person, that one person that is willing to stand and fight with them, whatever that looks like. Fight to the last breath or fight to have the right to take no more. You have to be that person. So be it and do it. And do it with poise and grace and love them for it. Because they could have 15 people who are all in their family and have a vested interest in them. And when you put emotions into play, the name of the game changes. We need to think about putting suffering into play and what this person's going to have to go through. And try to convince them to do what's right for them and for nobody else. Because we are born alone and we will die alone. Whoever else is around us in that moment doesn't have to experience what we do. That's our walk and our walk alone in that moment. So 
we have to let them know that and we have to support them in that. All right, digressing. All those things are very important. So please don't think I'm just, you know, shooting for the sake of hearing myself talk. I actually hate the way I talk. I hate hearing myself talk. I never even listen to these because the sound of my own voice is annoying. So I can only imagine what you guys have to go through. So um, we are treating people with dialysis. We're separating the waste materials from the blood. And the machine is called dialysis machine. Wow. Sometimes my mouth moves faster than my brain is thinking and processing. All right. So we have a couple of types of dialysis. We have in-center dialysis. That's traditional dialysis. You do it three days a week usually. You're in a center. There's nurses there. There's lots of people there. There's support groups going on during that time. And um, depending on how bad it is, it can go up to as much as five, sometimes it's daily dialysis. At that point, you're in home. So there's that. There's also home dialysis, which I just mentioned. And that's when you prefer to be at home or you have to be at home because, you know, you have other conditions that prevent you from leaving the home. All right. So that's done through a similar machine that looks a little bit different. Then they have peritoneal dialysis, which is uh, kidney failure, um, that uses the inner lining of your abdomen or belly to filter uh, the blood inside your body. So the act is the same. The way we do it, the route, and the environment we're in are different. So know the difference between the three and know what dialysis does and know who it's for. And then you should be good to go. So let's go to the next slide. I told you guys that Latin was gonna be a lot. Latin is always going to be a lot. Latin will forever be a lot. So more Latin, please, is the name of this slide. I'm sorry. This is the way it is. Melanoma. Okay. Oma means tumor. Pigmented cells or melanin. Ha ha. Remember that word? Melanin. Okay. So we have melanoma, which is the black rise from a mole on the skin. No tinnitus. Tinnitus is ringing of the ears. So tinear means to ring. All right. Then we got hemoplegia. Hemi means half. And then that's paralysis. Plesia, like paraplegia, right? Which is just the lower portion of the body. Versus quadriplegia which also involves the cervical disc and cervical areas or thoracic areas, right? Multiple sclerosis. So sclerotic means hard. And then multiple sclerosis is multiple uh, myelin sheath uh, are degenerated or destructive, or there is destruction to the myelin sheath which will then slow down uh, the transfer of information through that nervous system, okay? Because of, of that hardened tissue. And then uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So uh, let me get back up to multiple sclerosis. So what does that mean exactly? What that means is, is I have uh, a train track and that train track has a loose, uh, a loose track on one area, right? So we have to go a little bit slower because we know we got a loose track. Or we got a track that bends at a very, very steep angle that we know we have to slow down in order to make that angle. Does that make sense? So that would be the difference of the electrical conductivity if I were wearing rubber boots in a vat of water and I'm holding cables and I drop them into the water, but I've got knee-high rubber boots. Am I going to be affected? No. All right versus how it's supposed to run, which is I'm standing with in this leaky, like ankle deep water barefoot. And then I throw the electrical cords in. Am I gonna get that signal? Oh yeah, buddy, I'm gonna, all right? Multiple sclerosis would be, you know, me not retrieving that signal of, hey, die of electrocution, um, because I wouldn't get that signal because there would be something uh, that is sclerotic and not receiving that, sim that, uh, that transmission. And I wouldn't receive that transmission because I can't, because something is stopping it. So this is uh, the same idea as those hardened boots. It would be the sclerotic tissue. I hope that helps. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis, autoimmune disorder, characterized chronic inflammation. Rheum means flux. 
So it means the flux and pain of the joints. The idea of flux is an idea of something out of sorts, if you will. Okay. Know that MDI stands for meter dose inhaler. These are common acronyms, common synonyms, and or common synonyms, uh, common uh, surnames, things of that nature that you need to know. Um, so just make note cards for them because these are going to come up a lot. Next slide. All right, osteoporosis and calcium intake. So how do we ask for these things and what do we need to watch out for? Well, if I have a female who is 55 years old, I'm going to simply say, do you drink milk on a daily basis? Because they're going to be at an increased risk for osteoporosis because, you know, they are postmenopausal in theory. Okay. Um, milk and milk products are most important sources of readily available calcium. Uh, calcium and dairy products is well absorbed, whereas calcium and most leafy plants are not readily available. Remember, vitamin A, D, E, and K are all fat soluble. I can go into toxicity over these or I can go in severe deficiency. Either way, fat soluble vitamins, they stay in longer, which is a good thing, but they also make a bigger damage point if we have a deficiency of it, right? By way of breaking down your bones, by way of eating little holes in it, which is kind of a big deal, all right? So again, osteoporosis and calcium intake, these are the points that you need to understand. You also need to understand how we would go about asking a patient about this. And we just simply say, do you drink milk on a daily basis? All right, that'll give us a good indicator. So last slide, and just really quick, there's not gonna be any math on here because I think I'm gonna do a separate math uh, tutorial because um, it just, it needs to be done. I've been getting requests for it. So I'm gonna do this separately. Um, I'm gonna do, your math as well as other math. And I will let you know, um, I'll split it apart uh, group by group. So it'll say, you know, health assessment math versus foundations math, because I see how there's a transition versus med surge one math versus introduction, introduction med surge two math. So that's kind of going to be how it goes. All right. So next slide. All right. So let's finish off with HIV and AIDS. So it is a acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. That's what AIDS stands for. Suppression or deficiency of the immune response caused by exposure to the human immunodeficiency virus or HIV. Okay. It's a virus that attacks the body's immune system. If it's not treated, it can lead to AIDS. If it leads to AIDS, you're, you're pretty much a done deal. Um, there are currently no effective cures. Once people get HIV, you have it for life. However, comma, we have made some mad advances in medicine. So let's talk about AIDS and HIV and my time versus and your time, um, at least for most of you, because, you know, I grew up in the 90s as a kid. And uh, in 90s as a kid and as a teenager, um, I would hear about AIDS. And I remember the first time I ever heard about HIV and AIDS, I heard that every hour a person dies from AIDS or HIV related infections. And I thought, it's that bad? Really? What is this thing? It's creeping me out, man. We had a lot of different bad ideas about what it was and who got it and who only got it and what that meant. And then, you know, I was there during the Magic Johnson era where, you know, people were afraid to hug him on the court because they thought they were going to get it. I had a girlfriend who had a brother who um, had HIV when I was in the sixth grade. Nope, I wasn't in the sixth grade. I was 14. I would have been in the seventh grade because that's basically when I, yeah, basically when I started that deal. So yeah, um, I, I was about 14 and, um, my friend, her name was, uh, Stacy. She was my best friend and her brother had HIV because he got a blood transfusion. And I remember going, am I going to get it? Cause I'm your friend. And I didn't know, uh, you know, much about friends or getting around people or, you know, socialization or things of that nature, because, you know, we all know how I was raised, so I was a little wonky. Um, and I didn't know what this meant, and I really didn't care. So the first time I met him, I hugged him, and I um, he cried. And I thought, I'm pretty sure his tears aren't going to get on me, and then I'm going to get it right. Um, and we didn't have the internet back then. So I went to the library. There wasn't a lot of information on it. Um, so I just kind of waited. 
and then everything was cool and I thought all right fine well now we know it's a big joke and there's nothing to be afraid of uh, but back in my day back in my day it was a very terrifying thing right and then we had the real world which came out in like 1998 1999 it might have been 97 and we introduced these two characters uh, named Pedro and we had Rachel and Puck and there's a lot of them actually now that I'm thinking about it uh, Judd uh, and Pedro had AIDS and he died of AIDS uh, shortly after the show was was uh, aired and Pedro was beloved everyone loved him to death and you know he had a boyfriend named Sean and they were together and they both had HIV and, and, and AIDS um, and that was presumed that's how you had to live well no more because now we have medications where you take them and you're seronegative um, and if you are clocking seronegative on your blood studies for HIV you can have a relationship with a person and so long as they're taking their medication you won't get it we also have medication that uh, prevents us from getting it in the first place if we are sexually active with multiple partners right if that's our deal whatever who cares so you know let them do their thing but let them do it safe so now our world of HIV and the way we understand it is completely different than what it was you know back in the 90s when it was super scary and almost as scary as you know things like Ebola or you know how we how we see COVID in our head um, during its scary phase now it's a joke it's the same same deal before the world was going to end um, so know that when we get an HIV patient we're gonna have to put IVs in them know when we have an AIDS patient we're gonna have to put IVs in them and know that no nurse on God's green earth that is worth anything in this world is um, going to look at that patient and go I don't want to do it and know that every crappy nurse is Know that if you're the tough person on your unit, you're going to be the one that's going to have to do IVs on the HIV patient. And what's the difference? Nothing. Nothing is the difference. First off, let me give you some statistics. Statistically speaking, even if you were stuck with a person who gets HIV or has HIV and you stick yourself accidentally with that same needle while sticking them, the probability of you actually getting a needle stick infection based off of that is less than one percent you don't believe me look it up it's a thing okay i know this because i've actually been stuck while pregnant while giving someone a heparin injection i got stuck on my thumb by an hiv patient i cannot make these things up you want to talk about scary you want to talk about scary i was six months pregnant with my third kid is that right yeah that's right and I was terrified and I refused to take the medication because I was terrified I was gonna miscarry so I had to sit there and wait I waited for six months took the test negative waited for another six months took the test again negative I took that test like five times I'm good but you have to play the risk versus benefit game and decide um, if you are stuck is it worth taking the medicine and I looked up the statistics and I talked to uh, people in occupational health and we all thought that the best thing to do was to write it out and make sure it was okay and it was all right it's very rare to get these people that used to get HIV based off of blood transmission or transfusion would get them off of sex unprotected unsafe or they would get it via uh, you know IV administration other than that it's really really rare that that occurs anymore it does happen but please know as a nurse that the first thing you need to do if you ever get stuck with a patient who has HIV is you need to get out immediately and wash it 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 a million times wash it and then go straight to occupational health do not fill out the first incident report do not do any of those things if you know your patient is confirmed or if you get stuck with a patient that you don't know they'll do a panel um, more than likely as part of the incident report and you'll know and they'll keep an eye on you but know that you need to go straight down there and go handle it don't wait until the rest of the day don't do nothing just go straight down because a lot of times they might take you down to the emergency room and have you evaluated 
sometimes, depending on, you know, the circumstances behind uh, the transmission, whatever that looks like, because there's other situations where that would happen or something similar would happen where there would be a transfusion or a transmission of blood um, and or fluid or, or blood product based off of that. So sometimes you will be offered the antiretrovirals nearly immediately. Sometimes they tell you to wait. It just depends on case by case basis. But I tell you this because you absolutely have to act immediately if that happens. Don't sit around. Don't be scared sitting there in the shadows just wondering every daggone day because that's a really scary thing to have to feel. And as a brand new nurse, I didn't know. And they jump. They jumped when I stuck them with the heparin and they were so thin that when they jumped, it went through their tissue in their abdomen and then stuck me on my thumb. And I bled and the whole, the whole nine happened. And we both immediately, eyes as big as big can get wide open, looking at each other, freaking out, right? So what we need to do with these types of patients is we need to say things like, hey, do you jump when you get stuck? And they will let you know if they do or don't. And if they do, get a second buddy, have them hold their hand and distract them so that they won't jump, so that you reduce your risk of sticking yourself, okay? That would be my take home message for that. That's my, that's my um, moment to share with you. We all have a story where something bad happened. This is literally the scariest thing that's ever happened to me from another patient. Uh, it was unavoidable, unfortunately. I mean, it, I guess if I would have told them and they, like, I, I don't know, looking back at it, there's not a whole lot that I could have done differently. It was just a knee jerk reaction for them and completely accidental on my part as well. Um, but if it happens, you gotta go. So always make sure. Um, so again, we covered a lot of ground and we went over a lot of different things, but here's what you need to know, all right? Uh, proper medical care, HIV can, I, HIV can be controlled. With proper medical care and the right medications, HIV cannot be uh, transmitted to another person if they are dating, if they are showing up and clocking as a seronegative, okay? Um, they can have healthy lives. They can have healthy partners who never get it. They can have kids the whole nine, right? Um, so know those things related to HIV and AIDS, and uh, we should be doing pretty well. So some things I'm going to be working on after this, I'm going to start working on a uh, slide shift for the math, all right? And I told you what that was going to be like. I'm going to do the 12 cranial nerves. But I might give that an extra couple of days, um, or I might not, depending on what exit HESI needs. And um, I am going to probably do a couple of other little uh, 10 to 20 minute videos that I think you'll also find beneficial. All of the math that we are going to cover uh, for this overview, I'm going to do with you um, in class so that you don't have to worry about it. So we're going to go over it on Friday all of the math pieces and parts that we're gonna have. And then if you need another lecture uh, to help supplement, then I'll have that um, on another slideshow, okay? So happy studying. I hope this clarified a lot of things. I hope you guys do really well. I know you're gonna do really well. And I will see you at the next slideshow. Bye.